Welcome back to Analysis. Burma's most recognisable face, Aung San Suu Kyi, has once again been hitting the headlines over the last couple of weeks. This time, though, the publicity has been less favourable than usual. In a recent BBC interview, the pro-democracy leader failed to condemn anti-Muslim violence. This sparked accusations of hypocrisy for not doing more to protect the rights of Rohingya Muslims. Since last year, hundreds of Rohingyas have been killed and thousands displaced in clashes between Buddhists and Muslims. So should Suu Kyi's opposition party be doing more to address the violence? Flamina Giambalvo has this report. In a recent BBC interview, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi denied ethnic cleansing of Rohingya Muslims in Burma. The Burmese opposition leader admitted ethnic violence was an issue in the country, but said that fear existed equally among Muslim and Buddhist communities. The Burma UK campaign, a leading human rights group, have accused Ms. Suu Kyi's party, the National League for Democracy, of not doing enough to support the Rohingyas, one of the world's most vulnerable minorities. I, th I think the Aung San Suu Kyi's failure to unequivocally condemn anti-Muslim violence is certainly going to be influenced by the fact that um, there is a very strong uh, anti-Muslim sentiment in Burma. Um, but I think it's, it's a mistake for Aung San Suu Kyi to think that the way to address uh, these sentiments is to be silent. This Burman Buddhist nationalism that is sweeping the country is, is a very dangerous force. It will have to be confronted, and the longer it's left, the harder it will be to do so. Aung San Suu Kyi is pushing for democratic change in Burma, but has never openly condemned the widespread violence targeted against Rohingya Muslims. I, I condemn all violence and hatred, but I don't believe in condemning people. It's the acts that we don't like. The people we can reform, the people can be made to see things in a different light. And if we want to get them together, condemnation is not the way. Since the onset of the violence in early June last year, over 230 Muslims have been killed. Nearly 150,000 Rohingya Muslims have fled the country due to the scale of the attacks. Not getting a sufficient facility to get a high level education, to get a high level treatment, to get a uh, to go to be free movement, anything. We just control ourselves instead of taking. Evidence compiled by human rights groups, journalists and academics strongly indicates that the violence amounts to ethnic cleansing. Others have gone further. The Toronto-based Sentinel Project recently described Burma as a nation on the brink of genocide. An Al Jazeera documentary found evidence of at least two mass graves and the deliberate murder of minors, some of whom were burnt alive. The programme includes eyewitness accounts of the extrajudicial killings of more than 200 people during five days in June. Aung San Suu Kyi and her party are not the only ones accused of failing the Rohingyas. Burma UK and other groups have also criticised the UK government for having a rose-tinted view on the situation in Burma, as the UK seeks to secure an economic foothold in Burma. It has been reported that the UK has provided assistance to the Burmese government to conduct its upcoming census. The survey denies the existence of Rohingyas and instead identifies them as Bengalis. As Burma and the wider international community gear up for economic and political change ahead of the country's 2015 elections, human rights groups are still concerned that the situation of the Rohingyas will not see any improvement. Flaminia Giambalvo, Islam Channel. Well, joining me in the studio to discuss all this is Choi Wynn, Secretary of the Burmese uh, Muslim Association UK, and Lilian Fan, Research Fellow at the Humanitarian Policy Group for the Overseas Development Institute. Joining us on Skype is Emmanuel Stokes, freelance journalist specialising in human rights, who's written articles for the independent Al Jazeera, amongst others. Uh, welcome to the programme, everybody. So, Choi, what do, you, what do you think is going on here? Do you think there is, as one of the contributors to that package said, simply uh, a wave of nationalistic sentiment and that even the opposition aren't standing up to it? Yeah, so far there are three people who publicly criticise so-called uh, global power of Muslim Islam, global Muslim power. Uh, first, the first one is uh, the Buddhist extremist monk, Wiyatu, who claims himself as a Burmese bin Laden. And another one, second one is a uh, right-wing politician from Rakhine Nationalist Party, Rakhine, uh, RNDP Party, Rakhine National Development Party. He's the president of the party. And uh, third one who joined the team is uh, 
Nobel laureate, our respected Nobel laureate, Chao Su Chi. And what really shocked us is as a Nobel laureate and our national leader, who really share us our pain and who really who should share our pain and sympathize on us. But contrary, she is now creating, hiding all those threat, potential threat of 969 Buddhist extremism and showing uh, global, Muslim, global Muslim power, which is totally absurd. And it's not inappropriate. And what we, I mean, more specifically, it is um, morally not right. Mm. And principally, it is corrupt. This is not totally wrong way she diverted the attention of the people, international community, to highlighting the wrong picture of the truth. Mm. So. Lian, why, why do you think that she's gone here? Because I mean, it, it, it was a fairly shocking clip that we saw when she said, all right, we're going to condemn acts, but n not the people doing them. It, it's, uh, it must be lost on many people how these two things can sensibly be separated. Why, why do you think she's taken this stance? I, I think... Um you know, the, the comments uh, that Do Aung San Suu Kyi made have quite rightly actually shocked um, many, not only in the international community, but also domestically. There have been um, criticisms and a lot of worry, in fact, uh, by many, you know, not, not even just activists, but actually people in the government, many professionals within uh, Burma, who have been really worried about this wave of ultranationalism and, and are trying to do things to actually, you know, to, to try to stop it and in any way they can. And, and they've been horrified, actually, by the violence. So it has been really quite shocking to see, um, you know, the sort of failure to condemn. I mean, I think that, you know, she certainly has a point to say that perhaps condemnation might not be the most constructive um, mode in which to engage, you know, the very people you're trying to convince. Um, but at the same time, condemnation is necessary when you have such brutal uh, violations of human rights. And, and I think that... Um, you know, one should not, one should not um, stop oneself from actually being very vocal about condemning what is absolutely unacceptable, but at the same time working in a way to try to engage those who have been involved in such acts. I think that that shouldn't be a contradiction. Mm. E Emmanuel, let me bring you into the discussion. Do you think this is... Uh, do you think this is um, perhaps a misreading of how a sort of process of of uh, sort of steady reform, which is what the opposition seem to be committed to, works. Do you think that they that they think if they soft pedal on the uh, on the regime, that perhaps um, that will facilitate the reform, uh, whereas perhaps it may do the opposite? No, I think it's 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 a political choice for um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, to basically avoid committing political suicide by showing any support for the Rohingya, which she's failed to do consistently for a long time now. Uh, she refers to them as Bengalis um, because she knows that if she uses the word, it's beginning to give them some sort of legitimacy as a, as a national identity, as a native identity, which they were before the um, rule of Nay Win, uh, the dictator who did so much damage to the country. So I, I think it's just a very calculated political decision, um, which is expedient and totally shameful, really, when you think about the suffering that's going on with Muslims in general, but with the Rohingya in particular. And, you know, I, I know personally Rohingya activists that I have spoken to who are, are absolutely desperate for Burmese politicians to speak out for them. And the only person that they felt that they could turn to was Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, they've got a couple of Muslim and Rohingya MPs, a very small amount particularly with the Rohingya MPs and the USDP. But with someone like Dorsu, they genuinely felt that she was the only really influential politician who would stand up for them. And she's totally failed. Uh, and, and she failed um, the people who were involved with the um, protests up there with the copper mine and a whole load of other issues which are very closely linked to, to human rights. So, um, I, mean, there's, I mean, there's an element of political calculation, but I think it's, it's for her own personal ambitions. And I'm sure she's able to rationalise and say, well, you know, if I get rid of the, you know, the current ruling government, when I'm in charge, I can do a lot better for most people in the country. But I think she's deluding herself because there's going to have to be a lot of give and take and the very prevalent anti-Muslim racism and the extremely dominant and, and widespread um, anti-Rohingya racism, which is just out of control in Rakhine State, is not going to go away. And, 
she's going to have to make some tough decisions. Okay, um, let me put some of those points to Lillian here in the yeah. in the studio. Do you, do you think that I mean, in, in one way, perhaps um, the point that might kind of run off what Emmanuel's just been saying mm -hmm. is that perhaps people had a kind of exaggerated sense of how radical an opposition Aung San Suu was before uh, before she was set free. I mean, I suppose you might say that when you have a, a, a highly authoritarian regime and you have an iconic figure uh, opposing it, many, many hopes are bound to attach to them without necessarily analysing um, whether they're going to be radical enough to carry them through. Is, is that perhaps what we're seeing? In other words, that our expectations shouldn't have been that high if we'd looked more closely? I, I would actually agree with Emmanuel's analysis. I mean, I, I think it is a very calculated political position that she's taking. Uh, but I think it does also point at some level to also the depth of, you know, sort of ethno-nationalist uh, sentiment in the country, uh, which she feels that she perhaps has to accommodate to, mm. um, which is, you know, a, a, a terrible thing. Um, certainly for, you know, uh, most of all the people of, of Burma, but also in the region. Um, you know, it's a very dangerous trend and it has uh, implications actually not just for, you know, pluralism and peace um, and this, this reform process within Burma, but also actually for stability in the region. So I, I think, um, you know, whatever the reasons are, whether they're political or, or you know, maybe just that perhaps we've had um, unrealistic expectations that, you know, the point is that this violence is real and the racism is real and it's incredibly dangerous and we, you know, we have to find ways to condemn what needs to be condemned and and to find ways of, you know, working together to address it. Mm. Tori, do you think that um, what's happening, uh, you know, if, if we say where has this come from, if we're asking the question where has this suddenly come from, is this a, an authoritarian regime which is feeling under pressure but which still has sort of reserves of power and is using them to try and divide its opposition? Yeah, there are various analyses. The through this, the practical, the real realities, uh, Burma exists, uh, ultra-nationalism exists, exists in Burma since since colonial time. And as soon as we achieve independence, this is divert to minorities. And from other side, minorities who sign in Pinglong Agreement to form federal government and Burmese government, from Burmese central government, they have failed to I mean, uh, to complete their promise. And other side is this racism and religious uh, sensitivity in Burma is very high level. The political gain, I mean, which is very cheap, this type of political games are very, and, and very sadly say, I mean, this is not appropriate in today's, today's time in, in the world. But still using as a political gain for those parties to achieve their vote, to their popularity, and in some significant, in our really recent analysis, we find out some very interesting information from from Burmese government that they have um, training people inside the army camps regarding, I mean, racism, how Muslims are threat, how Muslims are dangerous compared to other religion, which is really really worrying, and this is, uh, I mean. If Suchi, Do Suchi um, decided to uh, cooperate with Burmese government, it doesn't mean she lose, she re, she refuse her. I mean, she leave the principle of human rights. Mm. It doesn't make right for her to choose this way. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, let let me just ask you a little bit about the origins uh, of this. I think Tori was suggesting there that you know there's a. And it wouldn't be the first country where there's a, 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 a post-colonial situation where, um, you know, then uh, division, the elite plays on divisions within the, within, the, within the society. And it wouldn't be the first time that a regime on the defensive has done this. It, do, do you think that these are, uh, these are the main causes or, or perhaps you think they lie elsewhere? Uh, well, there's a long history of uh, divisions in... Um, Recent history, however, the forerunner organization of the current ruling political party, the USDP, uh, the USDA, they had they hired thugs and trained them up to try and incite religious violence, according to various studies. So there is always this sort of, <laughs> and I'm not going to necessarily say that this is going on now, but there is always that suspicion that there's an element of, um, you know, Asian provocateurs working for military intelligence or whatever. That's always in the back of one's mind, but there's no very strong evidence that it's all about it yet. 
Um, yeah, I mean, there is there is naturally also this fertile ground for racist sentiment or um, uh, xenophobia to um, to bring forth violence and bring forth communal tensions because we've seen active um, violence between uh, various minorities and various races in the for years. And that does the right, does go back to the colonial era where the Brits favoured some of the Indians because Burma was a part of British colonial India until uh, the 30s, I believe, or, yeah, the 30s. OK, um, man, just let me stop uh, you there, because I, I just want to pursue that point here in the studio a little bit. How much do you think... Uh, how much, Lilian, how much do you think it, this is rooted in the colonial past? I mean, Troy and Emmanuel have both mentioned this now. How much of a carryover is there? Because, you know, I think modern commentary tends to think that there's an absolute breach, and, of course, there is an important one between the colonial past and the, and the modern thing. But how much of this is, is carrying on from that time, do you think? Well, I mean, colon or, colonial, or consequence? The colonial, colonial history would always, to some degree, you know, define uh, the terms of of, of post-colonial states. I mean, that's that's just, you know, the, the, the rule everywhere. And in, in Burma in particular, but also in other parts of, you know, certainly Southeast Asia um, as well, and, and most other parts of the world, I would say, you know, there's, there's, it was part of colonial administration to sort of, you know, organize the state, but also the economy in, in ethnic terms, or in some cases, religious terms around political identities. That's not unique to Burma, I think. The point is, what do you do after that, after independence? You know, in, in Malaysia, for example, you know, the country that I'm from, we've had to deal with this as well. You know, Singapore's had to deal with it. Many countries um, all over the, the post-colonial world have had to deal with this problem. Um, so it's not, I think, it's not, I don't think it's sufficient to explain things away just by saying that, you know, there's a colonial history to it. Yes, of course. I mean, everything has a history. But, you know, you can make political choices. You can, you can deal with... The problems that you inherit, mm. um, and I think that um, particularly now, as, as as Burma is going through this, um, you know, what we all hope is going to be a historic um, and positive reform process. You know, I think everybody would want to, to really see this succeed, but they have to be willing to address the legacy of that very difficult history, which is not just colonial; it's also, you know, authoritarian that's and colonial, really yes. under the military regime. Mm. That's when you had also, I think, um, a real. Uh, politicization of, you know, particular forms of identity, the exclusion of, you know, certain groups like the Rohingya, for example, mm. from uh, citizenship, um, but also xenophobia towards uh, Muslims uh, mm. in general. Uh, so do you think perhaps, you know, Lilian was making some sort of regional comparisons there. Do you think that the Rohingya now have a, a long fight in perhaps the, the sense that the East Timorese in Indonesia or, or the, in, indeed in Aceh, yeah. there is a long, a, a long fight to establish a kind of... Um, almost a right to exist uh, with the regime. If you compare the degrees with East Timorese or somewhere else, I think I can say that the uh, UN has already described as uh, the most persecuted people on earth. And the degree they have, they are facing is, is extra, extraordinary. I mean, they have something uh, unusual. The way they are just persecuted and those who've been in those areas, they are always, they feel, they, whenever they see it, they're shocked. Because the way, even the doctor, Rakhine doctors, doctor has some code, I mean, they are, have they have humanity, at least humanity they have in the community. Mm. But even they refuse to treat Muslim patients. So the level of the persecution is so deep and so high level. Mm. So it is not easy to to take away, to go with a uh, few days and few months, a few years. It needs a lot of efforts. And Rohingyas recently, uh, the way they have used Rohingya people to unify Burmese Buddhists, it's really worrying because it's, it is a, definitely Burma is a brink of genocide. Because I used to say that if, we, if, if international community do not deal with this, with this situation properly, and it could be second uh, Rwanda. Mm. And this is really worrying. But the worrying is not because of the uh, potential problem itself, because the taking sideline people, those who are who are supposed to be human right defenders, they are now taking sideline with those extremists. Okay. Well, let me put some of those yeah. points to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, um, 
so, sorry to, to uh, cut you off there. We were losing the signal. But um, let me just ask you ab about the sort of resources of resistance here, because we have a tremendously embattled uh, community for the reasons that, that we've just heard. But are there any bases, either within the international scene or uh, in, in Burma itself, um, are there any alliances that can be made that might be able to break down this nationalist wave? Actually, you know, a, a, a lot of the, I, I personally think a lot of the help we're going to have to get is going to come from the outside. And a lot of that has to come from the Muslim world, as well as the European Union and the West and so on, who so often like to trump, uh, you know, human rights defending credentials. But the OIC is going to play a really important part and other important countries, Muslim, predominantly Muslim countries in Asia and others need to be applying pressure from the outside because that will be the sort of thing that's going to move the government because the government works in a very self-interested way and at the moment I think it's under a lot of pressure from the RNDP which is the dominant nationalist party in Rakhine State to basically you know acquiesce to their more or less you know near genocidal agenda to just totally permanently segregate the Rohingya and make their lives hell. Um, for, for the um, Rohingya themselves, there are some Rohingya parties that are attempting to be formed. Uh, met people who were um, involved in that in Yangon and other places, but they're now you know, having a lot of what they're doing being shut down by the police and security services. So it's really, really hard for them to do anything. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be up to the international community, to people with conscience, to prevent another, you know, never again moment, which is what it will be once the, you know, the thing goes all the way down the line and becomes genocide. It may not quite be there yet. It's only a technical, you know, sort of distinction whether or not it's ethnic cleansing or, or genocide, depending on what one's interpretation of that is. And there's a much more clear legal definition of genocide, which I think I would probably shy away from right now. But ethnic cleansing is definitely taking place. So th there's already enough warnings out there for the international community to intervene. And they're not doing that sufficiently. And part of that is because the West wants to contain China. That's one of the major um, uh, you know, foreign policy objectives, certainly for the US and for other nations too. And now what you see is the UK and Australia and others wanting to have military to military ties with this, you know, the military, which is the sole institution in Burma that's been behind at least two pilgrims. Uh, of, of the Rohingya in, in the 70s and in the 90s, and certainly contributed to the latest one, and have been behind all the big human rights abuses in the country for years, for decades. So uh, things are going the wrong way in terms of international pressure, and that's the main point I'd like to emphasize. Okay, Leanne, do you read that in the same way that the the, the kind of lack of international support is, at least from the West, is uh, is to do with essentially Western attitudes towards China? Um. Well, I, I mean, it's possible that that's, you know, part of it. But I think I think there's a real also a hope that Burma is generally on the path to reform. And I, I, I do think that's quite a sincere uh, hope for many of the Western countries, but also the non-Western countries. You know, certainly ASEAN would uh, really like to make sure that Burma is actually on its way to becoming a, a responsible ASEAN member state. It is, in fact, taking um, the chairmanship, you know, mm. f uh, very soon, next year, in fact. Mm. Um, of the of the regional uh, association, so I think that it's probably a mix of you know political um, interests as well as a genuine sincerity. The the thing though is that you know I, th I think um, Emmanuel's right that there does need to be much more international um, you know pressure and willingness to actually speak out about the things that are not going well. I mean I think it's fine to say well you know some economic uh, reforms and certainly some political reforms are more or less um, you know. Uh, perhaps on track, and, and there are many promising signs, but there are certain things which are really almost going backwards. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't um, not condemn the, the kind of violence which has, which has um, you know, been so brutal and, and really is, um, you know, um, I think quite rightly, uh, you know, as Manuel articulated, is it's very close to, you know, ethnic cleansing, genocide, what we could call it. I don't think it is quite at that point just yet, but, the, you know, where do you draw the lines? Mm. And I think, you know, these are warning signs. And let's not let let's not wait until it does get to that point. There have to be ways of engaging. I do think, though, that besides just international pressure, certainly regional um, engagement needs needs to be at the forefront of this. And there are already um, attempts from you know Indonesia, Malaysia, and many other neighboring countries to um, you know try to put more more pressure in in a cooperative uh, kind of way. Um, uh, you know, on the Burmese government uh, to, to really take action on this. I don't think, though, however, um, that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, I, th I think there has to be uh, a degree of, um, 
sensitivity to the way it's being articulated internationally. Because yeah. I, I have to say that, you know, the OIC, for example, can be very useful, but they should also be quite aware of, you know, the particular language that they use to engage the government. So I don't think, you know, that um, it's helpful, for example, to say things which alienate the government to the point that they don't want to engage mm. you. So I think, yes, condemn the human rights violations, but also find ways of actually engaging them so the government does listen to you and does take mm. you seriously as a, as a player. So do you think that there's, um, th that there's a point at which criticism of the opposition, of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, uh, might actually uh, shift the opposition's stance? Because, I mean, one of the things that one way out of this is that the kind of nationalist consensus begins to break down. Do you think that's possible? Well, this depends on her strategy, political strategy. It seems to be the climate in political climate in Burma is uh, favoring minorities like a political suicide. And she seems to be, as a whole, she tried to appease the ex-generals, presidents and current government. And it, we cannot, and it proved reason her comments, and uh, we cannot hope any positive protection mm. for minority from her. And still she has, she doesn't have any power. Mm. She has influence, but she doesn't have power. We need no, to understand that. Let's ask Emmanuel about this. Emmanuel, we're coming to the end of the programme, but do you think that if there is a consistent criticism of the opposition, that that stance might change and that that might be something that begins to break down the nationalist wave? Or, or do you think that's really off the agenda? Uh, I think the NLD, actually, there are a number of people in the NLD, some of whom I've met, who are very anti-Rohingya, um, just as a, that's their personal position, and they're influenced by a sort of prevailing um, culture, unfortunately, of, um, you know, dislike towards the Rohingya and, and towards Muslims. Like, even I've met some Muslims here in the NLD and some Muslims in Yangon who think the Rohingya, are, you know, are bringing it all on themselves and that sort of thing. So a lot of these ideas have stuck within people's heads. OK, well, a I'm, large gonna, amount of I'm going to have to stop you there with that brief answer. I'm sorry to cut you off, but uh, that's all we've got time for. But no doubt we will be referring to this issue in future editions of The Analysis.